I believe it is, I believe it is now seven o'clock. Uh, welcome. And as we always do, uh, please join me in the sign of our faith as we put ourselves in God's presence. In the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving God, you are the giver of all we possess, the source of all of our blessings. We thank and praise you. Thank you for the gift of our children. Help us to set boundaries for them and yet encourage them to explore. Give us the strength and courage to treat each day as a fresh start. May our children come to know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. May your Holy Spirit help them to grow in faith, hope, and love, so that they may know peace, truth, and goodness. May their ears hear your voice. May their eyes see your presence in all things. May their lips proclaim your word. May their hearts be your dwelling place. May their hands do works of charity. May their feet walk in the way of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe peoples in the Treaty 3 area. We wish to recognize the long history of First Nations and Métis peoples in Ontario and show respect to them today. We give acknowledgement to the neighboring communities of Wajoshkanigam, First Nation, Obash Kan Dagang, and Ochi Chagwe Babigo Inning. My apologies uh, for my, those were my best pronunciations. I'd like to welcome you this evening. I know this has been a tough time for everybody and I, and I really am proud of how parents, families, students and staff have, have done such a great job during this time. Uh, this evening, we'll speak to you a little bit about the importance of routine, how to support with transition, ideas to increase, motivate and decrease, increase motivation and decrease power struggles, ways to encourage behaviors we want to see, how to set the tone for the day, separation between home and school, and how to help that transition for both kids and parents, both students and parents. And then there, there will be ample time for questions. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Sue and Sarah, who I believe are going to guide you uh, through a presentation and then there'll be opportunity for questions after. So welcome again and uh, thank you Sue and Sarah. Good evening everyone. Uh, please bear with me as I just pull up my PowerPoints here. So welcome everyone. Uh, we want to acknowledge that oops, we are all on the same journey when it comes to parenting during a pandemic. And we are with you and we hear you. We are all at different places and that is okay. Sarah and I will each present some helpful tips, but we'll also leave lots of time for questions or concerns that you may have. So one of my favorite quotes is provided by Dr. Bruce Perry, and he talks about how the most powerful buffer in times of stress is our social connectedness. So one thing we really want to emphasize over the next uh, hour or so we're together is let's stay physically distant but emotionally close. We know that our connections to um, other people are foundational for our health and well-being. So we encourage you to reach out uh, and connect as even a short text or smiling face on Zoom can help. Another key thing we want to highlight is mental health first, education second. So we know these added duties are challenging for any parents and they're even harder for parents who currently don't have the option to stay home uh, while schools are closed. Parents are now more than ever under increased stress due to competing demands of work parenting and ensuring our children continue to do their online learning. We are more isolated and our, and our typical means of coping are not available to us. We invite you to let yourself off the hook. Be kind to yourself and know that you are doing the best you can with what you have at that time. Our Director of 
education, uh, Derek Haim, has been very clear in his messaging as well to staff, uh, students and families that their mental health is to take priority during this time. Self-care for all has to be a priority as the better we manage our own stress, the more able we, will, we are to handle stressful situations. So at the end of the day, if you're exhausted, uh, just lay with your child and read a book together you both enjoy. Take those breaks together. So next I want to highlight some small changes that can make a big difference, not only uh, when things return back to the way they were, but also during a pandemic. So one thing we've really been stressing is maintain everyday routines. Children need routine and predictability in order to feel safe. And this is especially true during the time of a crisis. So some things you can do for routines is developing a schedule and sticking to it. And let your child have um, involve them in setting the schedule. As we know, when they have voices in things, they're more likely to follow them. So your schedule might involve regular meal times for bathing, schoolwork, socializing, playtime, quiet reading, and coloring. But we encourage you to stick with it throughout the day. We also want to really stress that bedtime and wake up times should remain the same as if kids were in school. So go to sleep when they would typically get to sleep and wake up when they would typically get up. This routine is really good for mental health as when children know what to expect, uh, their stress level actually decreases and routines are instrumental for this. Catch them being good. Some days this can seem really hard, <laughs> but Catch your kids doing things you like. The behavior we acknowledge is the behavior we're more likely going to see in our children. Uh, so things like a wink, a high five, a card saying you've been caught doing something good can go a long way for children. So we try and change the ratio. As I, I once read somewhere that for every one positive thing that happens with our kid, we actually notice four. So we want to switch the ratio to be four positive things and maybe one thing we would like them to do differently. So we encourage you to find those small moments or big moments and catch them being good. I think this one's been um, highlighted all over social media uh, is limiting kids exposure about COVID-19 um, and lip limiting their media exposure in general. There is some really anxiety provoking um, concerns going on in the world right now. It, and we invite you though to be curious with your kids. Um, ask them what they're seeing and hearing and get a sense of how they're perceiving things. But ultimately we want the media exposure limited. And one good rule of thumb is no exposure about two hours before bed. Eating family meals together. This is an old tradition that uh, has huge impacts on mental health. This is a great time to connect with your kids, with each other, share highlights. Um, and we encourage you to uh, have what we would call tablet free tables. So no screens, no phones, no TV on. Everything's off and it's just a time for families to reconnect. If your child did do something um, you aren't happy with, save that conversation for after dinner because we want meal time to be a positive time. There's lots of great questions um, on Pinterest or you could Google that you can ask your kids if you're having a hard time coming up with topics. One of my favorite, because the answer is always different, is I, we always ask our daughter, what would, um, you know, say dad do if he was principal? principal for a day, what would the school look like or what would mom do? And she describes us to a T. It, it's quite funny. It's one of my favorites. Uh, what would be the rules at school? If you could go back in time, what would you do? And again, there's lots of great websites out there that have a good list of questions to help get fun conversations started. Provide factual yet developmentally appropriate information related to COVID-19. So make sure the information you're sharing is from reliable sources such as the World Health Organization, uh, Public Health, Children's Mental Health Ontario has some great information and most of these sites have how you can explain it to the kids based on their developmental age. Uh, so it's really important we match the information to where our kids are developmentally at. And then of course have check-ins daily with your kids. Check in, see how they're doing. This is tough on all of us. Um, 
night times are my favorite time to check in and I'm sure that uh, I get more out of my child because she's just really delaying bedtime, but <laughs> I really enjoy checking in with her nighttime and having uh, conversations about her day. That's when she seems to be, be the most chatty. So find the time that works best for you and your child and when you could do those check ins. And of course, be kind to yourself. This is brand new for all of us. None of us have ever parented during a pandemic. So be kind to yourself. It is stressful. It's hard. Uh, the social um, isolation, it, it has impacts on all of us. So we invite you to give yourself a break and be kind to yourself. One challenging we have been hearing a lot of is transitioning from school parent to home parent. Uh, so if I'm being really strict, I'm Principal Sue um, to home parent. So this can be challenging for us and our kids. The first thing I would say though is your kids do not have to be doing school work from nine o'clock to three o'clock. Um, so what you could do is whatever amount of time you agree to set aside to do work, create a transition activity when that time period's over and that you're transitioning into um, you know, the regular home life, like setting that change of routine to cue, cue your child, okay, the kitchen table is no longer your school desk, it is now the kitchen table again. And they do need those transitions to help with that. So you might, you know, go outside, read a book with your child, um, have them help you get things ready for dinner, go for a walk. Your child may need to let off stream because sometimes schoolwork can be really stressful for them. Um, perhaps you might pick your favorite song and have a dance party or a quick family run around the block, perhaps a communal yell outside. Get creative um, and also have your kids come up with ideas to let off steam. Minute to win it is actually a lot of fun to kind of shake off those roles. Um, our favorite game because we all love Oreos in our house is when you put the cookie on your forehead and without using your hands you have to try and get it in your mouth. So try and have fun with it and create some activities that create some laughter and really shake off that stress. Give your child some grace. This is really tough. Um, we've been hearing that uh, kids behavior has has changed. They're stressed, maybe they're sad. So give them some grace. Uh, their transition from, you know, school parent to home parent is challenging on all of us. And sometimes we need to have just a little bit more patience with our kids. When your designated school time is done, ensure it's done. So let's say, for example, from 10 to 11 is your school block that you're going to do work. Um, stick to that hour. Don't make them keep going and doing their work. That will just lead into power struggles with your student. The oven timer is my best friend right now. I set my timer uh, so I can stay on track because sometimes when she's doing her schoolwork, I get stuck in other things and it kind of mimics the recess bell. So it gives her a sense of, of consistency with her schoolwork. Apologies. This is part of working from home. My dog sees probably a shadow. So ensure you're connecting with your child. Um, you know, make that time to connect with them. Maybe one day you skip the lecture and you say goodnight and share stories about when they were little that made you laugh. Um, that's a favorite in our house. Cook together, take their lead. Uh, see what they want to do and follow, follow their lead. During COVID, it's a great introduction great time to reintroduce things like perhaps a uh, mom and child date night um, and do it slowly and give them a choice in the activity. One way you might introduce a new activity is what you would call, okay, we're going to have a family meeting where we're going to talk about some changes I would like to try just so we can reconnect. Teens. We've been hearing a lot about teens and really um, becoming upset with their parents because they're having a hard time with physical distancing because we know their peers are their world right now and it's hard to convince them to practice it, follow the schedule, limit social media. Uh, first thing we want you to know, this is not personal. They're not mad at you, they're mad at the situation they're stuck in. So as hard as that is, realize that they're not mad at you. They're mad that they can't go see their friends. Um, their whole world too has been turned upside down. 
you know, and when you do kind of get into power struggles with the kids, step away and come back to it when you're both calm and have a conversation together validating how your teen is feeling. We're all having big feelings right now and we're all feeling a little frustrated perhaps right now as well. And together you might explore ways they can virtually stay connected with their friends. Um, and obviously right now technology use rules, they have been a little relaxed right now because kids are the only way our teens can connect is through technology with their friends safely. And let your teen decide some activities that they might want to do. Uh, one of the challenges teens, they think they're invincible, right? They're not going to get it. They're not friend. They're not sick. Sorry, their friends aren't sick. They don't get what the big deal is. And that's normal developmentally appropriate behavior for a teenager. So here's kind of some um, advice to help navigate why we have to practice physical distancing and it's hard to remind them that you know what it's actually not a, about you and your friend it's about maybe your grandparents right we have to protect them maybe there's a new uh, baby in the family you have to protect maybe one of your families are um, auto have an autoimmune disorder and are compromised so really help remind them see the bigger picture that this isn't about them it's also about protecting other people. Let them know, you know, you're not in this alone. There are two billion other students struggling with this as well. Um, and just validating for them that, that this is hard and this is hard for everyone, but it's not going to last forever. Um, sooner than later, this will be over. And then give them factual information about COVID. Um, as to why we are engaging in physical distancing, why restaurants are closed, why they can't go have big parties. Um, another key area we really are recognizing is a sense of loss, right? Our teens perhaps are graduating this year um, and they've worked so hard for a graduation ceremony and now, you know, that, that's been put on hold. So they are grieving as well. They're grieving losses of big events that typically happen this time of year. Sorry, Ella just is really happy right now. <laughs> and recognizing our ability as adults to regulate has been impacted. There's been a huge disruption of our teams. Our work life, our school life, our home life have collided. Um, and we are not recharging from this as well as we typically have been able to. The ways we might recharge like gyms, um, you know, going to yoga, those are all closed. So we have to find new ways and healthy ways to recharge. So our ability has been regulated. Our kids don't have sports. Um, you know, their, their band practice is canceled. So things that typically would regenerate us, um, recharge us, they're not around for us right now. And we have to figure new ways to recharge. And so figuring out how to start the next day depleted and not recharge is a big um, challenge for us. So what we do encourage is do small breaks throughout your day. So if you finish a task for work, we would encourage you to take a break. Go for a two to three minute walk, do some breathing, some mindfulness, pull a couple weeds out of the garden, pet your dog, uh, find small breaks throughout your day that will help recharge you and make sure you take care of yourself and find things that fill your bucket. And also recognize, as we know, we're three months in, this is going to be hard. And again, we have to give ourselves a break. So if you're looking for resources specific to mental wellness and coping during COVID, if you go to our main web page, click on our programs, click on mental health and wellness, you will see a coping during COVID tab that has a variety of resources there for parents and families. I am now going to pass it over to Sarah Pizer. Thank you. And with me as well, just bear with me for two seconds to share. There we go. I think we should be good. Thanks, Sue. Um, so I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about um, obviously parenting in the pandemic, but thinking about it more from a behavioral perspective. So thinking about behavior as anything um, that we can measure, anything that we can observe. Um, so kids do well if they can. 
Uh, this quote often gets attributed to a number of different experts in the fields of supporting kids, but it's really the mantra of all of us. It's true. Um, it's the right philosophical approach when we're thinking about helping kids, when we're thinking about dealing with what we might call problem behavior. Um, it helps to remind us that kids are doing the best that they can. They're doing the best that they can in the situations that they're in, but also with the tools that they have in the moment. Um, so it becomes up to us to understand this, to meet them where they're at, and to think about whether or not they have the right skills or if the skills that they have are sufficient for the situation. So if we think about these two pictures that I'm hoping you see on the screen, <laughs> um, it's not likely that we'd fault our little spaghetti eater over here. She hasn't yet developed the skills that she needs in order to be a socially appropriate eater um, due to her age, due to her developmental level, and if I do say so myself, due to her cuteness, um, it's probably easy for us to understand this. But what about our little fellow over here? Does he have the necessary tools to manage his situation? Um, and likely he is doing the best he can as well. Um, but at times it becomes really hard sometimes to see this and to reconcile the two. Um, so don't get me wrong, this isn't about excusing certain behaviors, it's about understanding why the behaviors might be occurring so that we can help. But here's where this quote has become especially relevant to me in the last couple of days or last couple of weeks and months with everything that's been going on because these big experts um, who have been saying this have often been adding to it. So I often hear now kids do well if they can and parents do well if they can. So as much as we can all probably hope and strive to be this family, um, the first family that's depicted here, who doesn't relate, especially these days, to the second scene that's shown? There's no doubt about it. Things are super stressful. These are trying times. As much as we used to joke in the past that kids needed to come with a manual, um, we now need a manual for parenting in the pandemic. We didn't know it was coming. None of us planned for this. And some days, even the best skills that we feel that we have aren't enough. And according to these experts, this only makes sense. When we're under a lot of stress, it's easy to feel and to identify this kind of stress physically in our body. So we might have a clenched jaw, we might have really tight muscles or sweaty palms, but we need to remember that it takes a really big toll on our mental capabilities. So simply put, under stress, we're not at our smartest. The most intelligent parts of our brain, they shut off. This helps our body, it preserves energy, so it helps our body to be able to react when we need to, but it makes things like problem solving, decision making, not biting someone's head off a little bit more difficult. Um, so even though we might have had pretty decent skills in these areas when we're calm, when we're under stress, they just become that much more harder to access. And right now we're under some pretty constant and significant stress, so it's bound to take a toll. Um, and I'm mentioning this for two reasons. First and foremost, we want to validate how we're all feeling. Um, it's hard. <laughs> Um, and that's okay. We're all doing the best that we can. We need to give ourselves permission that right now that's enough. And secondly, our kids' brains are wired in much the same way and they're also experiencing these impacts of stress. So when we have kids who typically would have coped, uh, or sorry, who typically would have struggled with things like change, um, with things like uncertainty, um, kids who might have struggled with problem solving or kids who weren't, weren't so flexible and had a hard time going with the flow, we're now going to see them really struggling in these kind of areas and we might see some specific behavioral concerns, but we also want to remember that kids who typically did well in those kind of areas, kids who went with the flow, had pretty decent problem solving skills, um, and those types of things, we might see that they're impacted as well and we might see some different behavioral changes that in the past we just haven't seen. Um, so there's a mismatch right now. We want to think about it that way, that there's a mismatch between the level of skills that they have in those particular areas and really the level of skills that this current situation is needing them to have. Um, things are going to be difficult and that's OK. So if you just take one thing away from tonight's presentation, that's kind of the message and, and really hoping what you'll hear. But in all honesty, we came to talk about some things. And so I really struggled with how I was going to put this presentation together. Um, I knew that, or I maybe was hoping, that a lot of you would have come looking for some behavioral strategies, looking for some tips, how to get kids to cooperate with at-home learning or general household chores um, during some of these uncertain times. But then I also knew how important it was that we stay true to the message, um, that we're all doing the best that we can and that sometimes our regular practices might just not be possible. So here I started to reach for the work of Dr. Stuart Ablon and the collaborative problem solving approach. Dr. Ablon has this really great structure for engaging kids and making plans to improve behavior. Um, in certain circumstances, he advocates for what he calls Plan C. 
And this is where pro um, parents proactively, and that word is super important, they proactively ahead of time reduce expectations. He's super clear, and we want to be really clear here. This isn't that anything goes. Um, this isn't that kids rule the show now, kids get to make all of the decisions. Um, they no longer have to cooperate with parents. What it means, though, is proactively and ahead of time, parents look at the skills. They look at that match of the skills that their kids might have, and they look at what the environment or the situation is expecting of the kids, and they might remove certain expectations due to a mismatch. And these might be some of those times. So you might find certain aspects of online learning near impossible, um, or there might be common household rules that right now just don't make sense. Or you might find certain times or certain activities or certain things that you always kind of engage in that power struggle with your child. And those might be some of the things that ahead of time you decide to scrap or you decide to be a little bit more lenient with. So Sue mentioned the clear message here has always been mental health above all else. Um, and Dr. Ablon really advocates for this. What he suggests is that we prioritize above all else our relationship with our kids. So during this, our goal, our priority, and all that we're doing is preserving that parent-child relationship. And we also want to think about preserving the kid's perspective, the kid's thoughts and feelings about school. So we want to preserve as much positive feelings as we can about school as well. So that might mean we be a little bit realistic. We know what our kids can manage and we make decisions that we feel like are in the best interest of their kids. So with that being said, let's tackle some of the pressure points that parents might be experiencing right now. I don't know if there's anyone out there looking at this picture that might be able to um, identify with our friend here um, and thinking about some refusals. So um, I kind of was thinking of this in a couple of ways. So if the no that you're facing is maybe some resistance to leave a preferred activity, let's say. So maybe you're one of those parents that has a gamer at home and you're finding that um, day and night, that's kind of all your child wants to do. Um, and it's really hard maybe getting them off the game. So what you might consider doing is planning a gaming schedule. Um, but what you'd want to do is intermix this with some regulating activities. So ahead of time, um, show your child the schedule. Um, show them, you know, look at how much time you actually do have to play video games. And here we want to really empathize with their position. And the one key here also is that empathizing doesn't mean agreeing. Um, so we can have conversations with our kids where we say, look, I get it. Video games are super important to you. Um, you really like playing video games and it's something you really enjoy doing uh, and you feel like that's something that you want to spend a lot of time doing. You've seen, you've heard their perspective, you're empathizing with it, but at no point have you said, and that's great, we're just going to play video games all day. Um, we're empathizing to get to a point where we can start to have some conversations. Um, maybe show them the schedule, show the amount of time that they have to play the video games, but start to talk about how some of this will be intermixed with some different activities. So here we want to think about picking activities that are regulating, activities that have an inherent rhythm to them. So we might play a video game for 20 minutes and then go for a walk. You might then come back and play the video game for another 20 minutes, throw a ball back and forth. Um, we want to think about activities that might engage all of the senses, um, and that provides sort of that regulating um, opportunities in between uh, some of the activity that our kids are picking. But in the midst of all of this, there's a couple of really important things to think about. So we want to remember to be curious, not furious. <laughs> I love this quote, but then I read it as a parent and I go, man, that's really hard. Um, but this is one of the reasons why um, we want to, or sorry, what we want to stress here is that when we're talking about any of these strategies, when we're talking about having any of these conversations with our kids or with our families, we're talking about having them proactively and not in the moment. Um, because this is really difficult to do in the moment, obviously. And when we're having moments of um, power struggles or escalation, any of those types of things, that's a time for calming and a time for regulating. It's not a time for talking and finding solutions. So the key to this is doing this proactively, and you'll probably find that it's a little bit easier to come from a perspective of being curious. Um, so here, if you're finding that you've got days that are revolving around power struggles or certain chores, or it's just always difficult to get cooperation, name it, talk about it. Come from that place of curiosity. Let your kid know, you know, I've noticed this is what's happening and seek their perspective. Often what happens is we assume we know what the problem is. So we assume we understand what our child's perspective is, why they're so engaged in this or why this is such a power struggle. And we seek to find solutions based on that. But often if we're a little more curious and we have the conversations about it, we find that there might be some other underlying things that we didn't even realize or we didn't even think about. So we want to make sure that we've listened um, because our best way that um, 
we can get someone to listen to us is to listen to them first. It's not how we talk about kids or sorry to talk to kids about something, but it's really about how we listen to our kids about it. So hearing their perspective, giving them opportunity to talk about why it's important, why they think it's so unfair that they have to do X, Y and Z, um, but having an opportunity to really listen, because once we've done that, there's a much greater opportunity that our kids will start to listen to us. We've heard their perspective. It makes them a little bit more amenable to hearing ours. And then we can start collaboratively coming together to find some solutions, collaboratively coming together to figure out how are we going to plan for the non-negotiables that are happening during the, the day. Um, it's not about letting kids do whatever they want. It's about understanding both sides and then working towards those solutions together. Uh, and the example that I've given might sound like it's an older student or an older child, sorry, um, but even young kids are able to do this. So when it comes to maybe examples of online learning or at home learning, we want to avoid power struggles because ultimately, again, our goal is preserving that relationship, but also preserving those positive feelings about school. So as we know, in these really big times of stress or at least extended stress, learning is difficult. No amount of cajoling, no amount of praising and no amount of reinforcement or even no amount of punishment will change that. We know those smart parts of our brain just aren't as accept accessible. And this is where ahead of time proactively we might be giving in certain areas um, and we might be getting at learning in different ways. So we know that learning happens within the context of relationship and you can use that right now. So maybe some activities that aren't being done in that traditional at home learning can be done in other ways. So there's all you know, I always think about fractions and baking, um, little kids. Um, color identification and laundry, big and little socks, all of those types of things that we might be able to get out of concept at the learning in the context of relationship because in moments of stress, we know that's what's going to regulate and that's what's going to help the most. The other piece too, as we all know, <laughs> we're going to get back to school eventually. Um, this will eventually be over and the concepts that get presented during at home learning will likely need to be revisited come September, come that, that, um, that transition back into school. So just remind yourself that all isn't lost. So I added this one last quote that in times of stress, the best thing that we can do for each other is to listen with our ears, our hearts, and to be assured that our questions are just as important as our answers. Um, that's from the lovely Fred Rogers, and it really speaks to um, kind of the, the core of what's at the heart of this message is that we want to hear um, times that are difficult, times that are power struggles, times that we feel like as parents, oh, we just don't know what to do, that our best defense is to listen, to figure out where things are falling down and then collaboratively come together with some problem solving. One of the other pressures that we hear a lot about from parents and from teachers is this difficulty of moving from activity to activity, sort of this dreaded transition. At the best of times, kids struggle with doing this, but now they're being asked to do this really in ways that they've never had to before. Um, at school, there's often lots of cues in the environment to help kids transition. So often you'll move from one area of the room to another to do a particular activity, um, or there's different almost rituals that happen within the course of the day um, that signals transitions and that help kids to develop those routines and that structure to be able to cope with different changes and transitions. But with this move to at home learning, these supports aren't there. They're not present and they're kind of tricky and not all that possible to be able to do within the home context. Um, so Sue spoke previously about the importance of routine, having a consistent day, having a flow to your day that remains consistent, and this definitely helps. Uh, and there's just a couple of other key points about transitions to consider as well. So it's generally understood that there's four parts to any transition um, and transitions. If there's something that your child struggles with, it can be really important to pick it apart to look at those four steps to kind of figure out where it is that your child might be having difficulty because then we know where we want to teach or where we want to intervene, so to speak. So the first step in any transition is simply stopping the current activity. Um, if this is a problem, the best strategy, surprise, surprise, is to be proactive. <laughs> Before your child even starts the activity, if you know it's going to, oh, this is going to be really hard to get them off of it. Before they start, problem solve for this. Um, this might include a concrete warning like, you know, it's not rocket science. You got two more turns before the game is over. Or I'm going to set a timer for 10 minutes and then we're going to go inside. Um, lots of times activities will have a natural break to them, so helping your child to find that natural break can be helpful. So, you know, when the chapter is over, the book is going away, or when the show is over, the TV is going off. Um, so finding those natural breaks can be helpful. And again, talking to your child. Oftentimes it's a conversation about 
When will you know you're done this activity or what will you need to do in order to feel like you're finished? Um, and being able to feel like they have that sense of completion with an activity might be just enough to be able to transition off of it. Um, or alternatively, before you even start an activity, you can map out with your child. You know, we've got 20 minutes to play Lego. How much do you think you can get done in 20 minutes? So map out what's a reasonable amount of activity you can do in the time frame and then provide them with the right amount of supplies. So we've got 20 minutes to build Lego. How much Lego do you think you can build in 20 minutes? Here's the right amount of blocks for that. This is far less overwhelming than dumping out a, you know, a 10 year <laughs> bucket of hoarded Lego. Um, having 10, 15 minutes to play with it, having to put it away without feeling like you've maybe had enough of an opportunity to get to all of the pieces that you wanted to get to. So this becomes far less overwhelming. If your child consistently has a difficult time leaving an activity, in particular, uh, technology is often one of these things. Um, then again, you can start at the beginning with this proactive plan. So again, it's that empathizing piece, listening, getting their perspective. Look, I've noticed it's a fight every time I tell you that you need to get off of the video game. Um, what is it about the game that makes that difficult? How do you think you'd be able to turn it off a little bit easier? So again, problem solving with them to figure out, we're not saying you get the video game on forever, we're problem solving about the best possible way in order to make that shift and that transition a little bit easier for you. The second step in a transition is shifting focus. So it's from moving your brain from doing this activity and thinking about it to now shifting your brain's focus to thinking about the new activity. And for kids who can be rigid in these types of areas, for kids who um, sort of get stuck in their thinking, if you have one at home, you're nodding and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, there's a couple of strategies that you can use for this as well. We can help shift. Um, the mindset. So there's something called the freeze point and share strategy. Um, bear with me, it might sound a little hokey, but there's some really important science behind how it works. So the first thing that you can do is get your child's attention, you've stopped the activity, you've explained to them what's coming next, and then have them freeze, point to where it is that they're going, and share what their plan is. Um, the, the pointing, there's some good research around the gesturing, that shifts our brain's focus. So making that physical gesture of pointing where I'm going helps our brain to start thinking about it. Same with sharing our plan. It becomes this mental dress rehearsal. We think about, we concoct this image in our head, which is quite powerful um, for our thinking about where we're going next and what we're doing. Um, and little things like that can really help kids to make that, that cognitive shift. And I know older kids, um, it might be something that you promise to do in the privacy of your own home and um, not have other people watching it happen, but it's just good practice of being able to be a little bit more flexible uh, and shifting mindsets. The next thing that happens in a transition is, st is starting the new activity. So we've shifted our mindset, we've started thinking about this new activity, we've gotten to where we need to be, and now we can do things to cue our brain in that we're going to start. Um, we can do some countdowns, we can talk about what it is that we're doing, and here what we really want to focus on is taking away as much thinking as possible about the new activity. Um, so shifting our brain and doing all of this kind of thinking takes a lot of work. So we want to take away as much thinking that needs to happen so we can talk about here's the textbook that we're going to use. This is what it's going to look like. This is the new computer that you have at home to do the work. So we want to take away as much novelty from that activity or from that situation so that we just can think and focus on this new activity. The other piece that's inherent with transitions is downtime. So I just you just have to think about a kindergarten classroom for this. You've got, you know, your first half of the class lined up, you're getting the rest lined up, and these kids have already wandered off. Maybe you've called your child for supper, you've gotten to the table, and there's a couple of minutes that happens while you're dishing up food, and where did they go? Um, you know, you're on your way outside, you're helping little brother get their shoes on, kids ready and they start to get a little dysregulated having to wait. So what we can provide in these times are what we call transition sponges. And I love that title because what it is, is it's things that absorb the wait time. So these can be fun activities. This could be um, you're dishing up supper, you've got them to the table. It's like walk around the table like a robot four times. Um, waiting to get outside, freeze and think of 10 names of a dinosaur. So just things that you can do that will absorb that wait time can be really helpful. The one last, I promise, consideration for transitions can also be what's known as a half step. So I might be outside playing and now I might have to come in and sit down and eat supper. 
Um, those are two really big different activities, right? So I'm here and I need to bring my body down here. This is probably lots of fun. Nah, this might not be as much fun. So in situations like this, you might want to consider giving your child a half step. So this is something that is somewhere in between the two. So I might love running around outside and hate coming to sit at the table, but sitting and coloring for a couple of minutes might be okay. So what you might do is an embed a half step. So embed an activity in between that helps their bodies um, and their brain and their thinking to regulate from this activity to this activity to this activity, because going from the high to the low might just be too much. And then the last tool that we want to talk about is reinforcement. And yes, it's a huge tool. Um, we know that the behaviors, Sue mentioned this already, but I think it's worth mentioning twice. The behaviors that we notice, the behaviors that we pay attention to and talk about to our kids are the ones that get repeated. So here we really want to think about paying attention to the behaviors we want to see again, catch kids being good. Um, this, we want to be also um, very descriptive in our feedback when we're talking to kids about this. So instead, you know, your child gets up, they bring their plate to the sink, and instead of saying good job, thanks, then we might say something like, wow, I really like how you're cleaning up after yourself, or wow, you're doing a great job following the rules and bringing your plate to the sink. So we want to be very explicit in our feedback, and we want to be letting kids know what it is that they're doing that we like, um, and this can be very powerful. You'll also see on the slide all sorts of different examples um, of ways of sort of providing more tangible reinforcement. So, um, you know, maybe you've done all of your online learning and now it's a time that we can go outside and play at the park. Um, and oftentimes from a behavior perspective, this is really important and we talk about it all of the time. But I think now more than ever, um, this is a really important piece to be thinking about. And it's really important to be thinking about um, providing some of those activities um, that are very, have a focus of connection. So how we're connecting with kids and how we're um, maintaining those connections throughout the day and doing fun activities together that are fun for everyone. We know that these are really tricky times. We know they can be really dysregulating for kids. So as much as we can have those connections with them and as much as we can do these activities with them and provide this for them throughout the course of the day, um, you'll likely find that some of the behaviors that maybe were a little bit trickier are slowly starting to reduce. So that is the end of the presentation, sort of the formal part of the evening. We have um, Ashley and Amy on hand um, who have agreed to help us with the question and answer portion. So I'm going to turn it over to them and they will explain how you can ask your questions. So hi there, hi there. this is Amy Stamp calling. And I, oh, it's echoing really bad on my end, sorry one sec here okay sorry so it's amy stamp and i'm just going to explain to you a little bit about what this is my role with the board is i am the mental health worker at uh, st thomas aquinas so i'm in the high school supporting staff there so the next part of today's session is designed to be interactive and engaging and allow for two-way communication if you are comfortable, we encourage you to use your first name to ask questions, but we understand that not everyone is comfortable in a live event, and so you can also choose to remain anonymous. To ask a question, you're going to click on the question mark box in the upper right corner of your screen, and that will open the live event Q&A chat window. And in this window, you'll be able to type your questions. Sue and Sarah want to make sure that they're able to give each question attention. So Ashley and I'll be reading each question one at a time and then either Sue or Sarah will respond. And Sue and Sarah will answer as many questions as they can today. If they can't answer your question or they simply don't have enough information right now, then they will let you know. And something to note is your question will not automatically show up after you submit it. And that's because we're holding them in a queue. So this is that so that Sue and Sarah have time to address each one. You also may have similar questions to questions that are already in the queue. And that's what Ashley and I will be doing is watching out for duplications or similar questions. So we'll do our best to filter them out if they've already been answered. And to see the questions from the entire group once they've been answered, you can click on the featured. So that's all for me. Um, Ashley, do you have any further thoughts or instructions that you'd like to share before we begin? Thanks, Amy. Can you hear me okay? 
Yeah. Okay, so I will just add um, my name is Ashley Creed and I am the mental health worker specific to Pope John Paul. Um, but the only thing I want to add on to Amy's is that we have found that it's best to keep questions as concise and as short as possible. And we also suggest that for multi part questions that you ask um, them in separate questions just to make it easier. Okay, so with that, we will get started. So please feel free to ask away. Apologies for that. So what we learned from other live events is to wait a few minutes uh, and usually it takes the first courageous person to ask a question. So feel free to ask anything, um, anything you're wondering. Okay, so we have our first question uh, from Lee. My 13 year old son has refused to believe that this is real school. So how do we get him to believe that this is the new normal? Uh, thanks for asking Lee. That's a really common question we're getting actually, especially amongst our older students uh, and letting them know that this is our normal right now and that all of Canada is pretty much learning virtually um, and sit with your child and chat with them and explore their feelings or wondering perhaps the virtual platform is challenging for them maybe connect with the teacher and brainstorm other ways they might be able to do the work but we definitely are hearing it's a challenge um, and we encourage you to involve your your child in trying to uh, come up with a plan to do the the school work uh, and come up with a set time every day to school do the school work one thing we do in our house is we do uh, our work together so while ella's doing her school work i'm doing my school work which is my work um, so really reach out to your student and have that conversation and find out uh, what their wonderings are what they're thinking and then brainstorm with them okay listen um, you have to do your your, your school work. Uh, how are we going to ensure you get this done? And here's where you take as many ideas as possible from them. You have them come up with what might be the best solution with limits. I mean, obviously, I'm just not going to do it. Might not be what you're comfortable with. Um, and then implement the idea they said. Obviously, kids right now need a little bit of grace. Um, but what I would say is routine is great and doing a little bit of school work is great as well. So I'm not sure if Sarah, you have anything to add to that? Definitely all along the same lines and, and um, just engaging with your child to figure out what might be worthwhile for them and um, just listening to their perspective and figuring out how maybe you can embed some of that. Um, and then the only other thing that popped into my head was what are the opportunities or some ways that you can give them a little bit of choice? Because um, I think what we also acknowledge with teenagers is their job, their role, their entire developmental purpose right now is sort of finding that autonomy and finding kind of who they are separate from all of us. And now we're kind of micromanaging them more than we kind of ever have been before. So where are these opportunities that we can start to give a little bit more choice? So doing schoolwork, as Sue said, opting out, eh, not a choice, but you have choice in um, maybe what some of the activities are that you do, how we order the activities, the way in which you do those activities, maybe when you do them. Um, so the only other thing I would add to that is just how can you embed a little bit of choice um, so that maybe kids feel like they do have a little bit of control in times where um, that control has really been kind of zapped and taken from them in a probably pretty unusual kind of way. Okay, so I have another question. This is from um, an anonymous person. So how do you encourage high school students to complete work when the ministry has stated that their marks will not change as of March 13th? Very difficult situation. Sorry, bear with us as we switch back and forth. Uh, we appreciate your patience as we figure this out virtually. Um, yeah, so the kids have 
been made aware that the ministry has said that Mark's uh, post March break um, no longer will count only if they go up is my understanding. One thing I would encourage is to continue to try and keep those routines in place. I, I think it was a 13 year old uh, boy and just stress the importance of staying on top of your schoolwork, how it's good for stress, um, you know, limit it to perhaps an hour a day so it's more manageable. It definitely is a challenge when the messaging has been uh, put out there and kids are, are now aware that their marks cannot decrease. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm with you. It's a challenge. I would just keep the door open and keep trying to encourage them to do a little bit of work. And just depending on maybe relationships with the teachers too. So you mentioned before in the first um, question of just being able to reach out and maybe get some encouragement or some feedback from teachers um, to see if maybe that helps at all. Uh, and then again, to be thinking about um, maybe having some discussions with kids about what does Plan C look like then? Because Plan C also isn't a free for all. Um, so in lieu of maybe some of these activities, from their perspective, what do they think would be good uses of their time? And you might find that um, it might not be specific schoolwork, but there might be other ways of embedding that learning in, or there might be other ways um, with some, you know, conversations and consultations with teachers um, that, again, maybe uh, they have some other suggestions or some ideas about what might be productive uses of their time, and maybe there is a plan C um, that gets settled on that way. Okay, so we have another question here from a parent. Uh, my 10 year old daughter acts like she's cooperating, but then doesn't follow through. For example, she agrees to do one page of math before going outside, but then just scribbles random answers down and goes out. <laughs> How do I get her to hold up her end of the bargain without a fight? And yeah, and I'm thinking 10, that, <laughs> that might be a little, <laughs> it's frustrating. Um, and on the one hand, um, it might be a little developmentally appropriate and, and maybe it's having those conversations about, um, you know, look, I, I get you want to get outside and getting outside. Hey, like who doesn't want to be outside right now? Um, and again, that piece of empathizing and listening and um, and kind of hearing their perspective on it uh, and then maybe sitting in throughout that process and encouraging. So if you think about um, and sorry, my brain kind of goes to the behavior side of this. If you think about doing a whole worksheet, um, that's a pretty big, complex task, right? So there's probably um, a variety of different questions on it, a number of different things that she needs to do in order to be done. So you might consider taking that big task and breaking it into smaller component parts. Um, so it might be, okay, do this one question. I'm going to come back and check. Or better yet, when you've got this question and you've done it your best, come and show me how awesome you did. Um, so you might consider taking big things, breaking them into smaller pieces, and then using that power of reinforcement, that power of praise, that power of beefing her up um, for the pieces that she's done incrementally until you get to the end of that whole worksheet. And now it is time to go out and play. Um, and now there's going to be so much fun because of how, you know, what a great job that you did on your worksheet. So sometimes just breaking those big tasks into smaller parts can be helpful. Sorry, I have a 10 year old as well, and we went through something very similar where she had to do a journal and uh, I, I know her level of work and there was no effort put in. So we do elbow to elbow learning now where I sit with her and we do it together um, and we try and have a little bit of fun with it as well. So, um, you know, sometimes I find sitting with them and doing it with them helps, but yeah, that, I would say that is pretty developmentally normal. I'm sure our teachers experienced it as well, um, but we just encourage you to do the best you can. And if perhaps the worksheet um, is a challenge for your child, maybe find other ways to do the learning and connect with your teacher, because really we want it to be about the joy of learning. OK, so our next question is from a parent. Um, it says that I know we talk about how this will eventually be over, but it seems like it will not be anytime soon. I feel bad trying to give my child a time when things can get back to normal. They are frustrated because it seems like they keep missing out more and more. And that's where you, 
we all just have to be honest with our kids is we we really don't have a time when this will be over uh we do know it it will eventually and just empathize and sit with them and validate their frustrations because we don't have the answers right now we don't know what things are going to look like a month or two from now um so sitting with your children with those big feelings because it's hard i mean i i honestly couldn't imagine being a kid right now and uh not being able to see my friends and having my world for upside down without um, truly understanding what has happened like like adults uh, have so um, giving them a little bit of grace during this time as well but it, it certainly is a challenge and 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 I think it fits here but um, the other thing that I keep going back to is thinking about those connections um, and it was really obvious to me that we're missing them right now, right? And that we are not connected with family members, with friends, with people that we typically are. Um, and I got it kind of here, <laughs> but I was listening to a webinar the other day. I think it was Gordon Newfelt, and he said, you know, as humans, we are so connected all of the time, but we don't realize it. He, you know, you go to the grocery store and you bump into someone, you're out washing your car and your neighbor drives by. Um, you know, you're walking down the street and you stop and you chit chat with someone, you go to the coffee room and you've had five interactions with a person before you've even begun your day. Um, and so we are so connected all of the time without realizing it. And all of a sudden, all of these connections have been taken away. Um, so what he really stressed was finding ways to be intentional about it. So maybe helping your kids. Um, and, and I feel like it helps here just in terms of bringing a little bit more normalcy into it. Yeah, maybe we don't know when it's going to be over, but these are things we can do to help. So maybe it's structuring a day so that we know we're reaching out to grandma every morning at nine. Um, we know we're calling a friend at two for a little Zoom conference or something like that. But just really finding ways, because right now we have to be so intentional about our connections. So finding ways to help kids in doing that might go a ways um, of just, you know, reducing some of those feelings of uncertainty. Okay, so next question, anonymous. My daughter is a visual learner and is struggling with certain subjects at home. How do I support her and teach her with what we have at home while still trying to keep her, uh, try to keep her from falling behind even more? And I, this is a, a fabulous question, and I think it's a fabulous question for a number of different kids who might be learning in different ways. And I, and um, as not a teacher, I hesitate a little bit in giving. Um, a specific answer to this and what I would really suggest is reaching out to the teacher, um, potentially reaching out to the learning resource teacher and, and asking for some different strategies and asking for some different ways um, that maybe you can be getting at learning with this with with your child, um, but then using the strategies and, and using um, what you typically would use at home. So it might Pinterest so is a great resource for looking at just different visuals that can be printed off and different, um, you know, those visual task analysis that first I need to do this, I can tick it off, then I need to do this um, and finding out maybe ways that you can pick a routine um, and then you can visualize that for them. But if it's specific to schoolwork, um, I don't know, Sue, if you have any other suggestions, but if it's specific to schoolwork, I'd really encourage you reaching out to the teacher. Okay, so our next question is from a parent. Um, I ask my child to do fun things at home and come up with many fun experiences. They are in such a slump. They are just, sorry, they just want to stay in their room all day. Um, I set up online chats with their friends and they are still not interested. Any suggestions? Yeah, I would, um definitely connect with your child and comment on the behaviors you're noticing like you might say to them you know i noticed that um, you're wanting to stay in your room all day you're not wanting to connect with your friends in the, anymore i'm kind of wondering what's going on if you notice uh, big changes in your child's behavior like they're not interested in activities they typically used to do um, they've really isolated themselves you've seen a real change in sleep patterns so perhaps they're sleeping more than usual or less than usual changes in appetite those are uh, times you might want to reach out to a mental health professional um, but also recognizing that behavior change during this time is also completely normal so to start I would sit with your child connect with 
them and get a sense of what's going on for them and what it is they're hoping um, you know you could do to help but just know that uh, there is a mental health team here available you can reach out if you have any additional questions but the main thing right now is connecting with your child validating how they're feeling um, and just being there as a caring adult for them. Okay, we have another question here from Anonymous. With potential extended summer learning, can you share any additional resources for scheduling days, routines, expectations, etc.? I have a couple favorite websites I go to for this. Uh, Triple P, The Power of Positive Parenting is one of my favorite. They lay out nice uh, visual routines that parents can use. Also, CHEO, that's C-H-E-O, is a phenomenal resource for parents that has lots of strategies on uh, coping during COVID, setting routines, and then our board web page under Mental Health and Wellbeing COVID-19 Resources. We do have helpful tips on there. What I would really encourage is to make lots of time for fun, lots of time for different types of learning um, with your child. Okay, so our next question is, my high school student is really torn about graduation and how she is missing out on this amazing experience. She has lost complete excitement in this milestone. I am trying to help her cope, but I feel like I'm not making a difference. Honestly, my heart breaks for our grade 12 students. Um, that's a pretty normal reaction. It's uh, view it as grief and loss. It's the loss of a big event that they've been looking to perhaps since their elementary uh, days. Um, so treat it like a loss. It's, it's okay for her to be sad. Um, it's okay for her to grieve the loss of her graduation. And I think what you're doing is exactly what she needs, which is just being there with her, um, connecting with her and working through those, peri those periods of pain with her because it, it is incredibly tough and it is something that's really been hard for our students. Okay, next question. I have a teenager. Should I be lowering expectations around the house, such as chores, bedtime, etc., because at home learning is stressful for her? Or should we keep the expectations the same so that things feel normal and she continues to contribute to the family? And I, if I can try, I think that might be a conversation to have with your teenager um, and to make the decision that you feel fits your family the best. Um, it's true, uh, they've looked at sort of the schedule in terms of what's a reasonable amount of time for kids to be online learning, and it's a new format of learning. It's different kind of things, brain activity that needs to be going on, and it's extremely difficult and, and it's tiresome. Um, so considering other areas that if that is what her day looks like, if that is a lot of time that she's spending doing, then perhaps it does make sense to find other areas that maybe um, you're reducing, or if you find that um, in lieu of maybe not doing some of that, there's other activities around the house that are important um, for her to be doing, to be contributing in that way. But I think it's a conversation maybe to have with your child, to have with your family, um, and thinking of sort of that, um, that collaborative process of what's your perspective, this is my perspective, and let's come together and come up with something that makes the most sense for us. I hope that helps. Um, it, it, it just sort of feels like it's probably going to be um, something that's very specific and very individual to what fits your needs best as a family. Okay, so I have another one from Anonymous. My daughter feels lost. School was her social time and now with children not her age in our area, she feels alone all the time. We try as parents to include her, but it isn't the same. What else can we do? Um, I'll let Sue chime in after I just am the live one. Um, it, yeah, it's um, you're right. It's not the same. I uh, I have an only child and that's something that I struggle with too is there's not a lot of um, connections that she can be making with other kids right now. Uh, Sue's giving the thumbs up because she's in a similar situation. So it's again um, having the conversations with your child and finding out what's going to work for them um, and finding those other opportunities and I think maybe the 
um, and kind of tweaking back to some of the conversations that another parent had asked about, you know, I come up with all these fun ideas or I offer all of these things and my kid doesn't really feel like doing them. Um, and what it might be is just exposing them to those ideas over and over, um, offering them over and over, offering different things um, and just making them available. So maybe now isn't the time that she's feeling comfortable doing them or now isn't the time that it fits, but I can mention it again tomorrow and see if that's something that you're interested in doing and, and keeping those things um, remaining available and open. Um, and then, yeah, are there creative ways that they can think to make those connections? And again, thinking back to how can you be intentional about connection and how can you be intentional about connecting with maybe other kids virtually from school? And again, much the same as we're not the same as our parents' friends, having those connections online aren't going to be the same either, um, but are there different ways or, or ways that she can think of or that you can think of that helps to replace some of that? Um, but then in the end, it's really just about validating that experience. Um, you know, letting her know that you get it. It is really tricky. Um, she might be really surprised to hear from you that I know I'm not as much fun as your friend and that you are missing your friends and you're sort of mourning not having um, that contact with them. And maybe just even hearing that and having those experiences validated um, will just will go a long way in letting her know that other people kind of get what her experience is. Sorry, there's a delay in, in going live. Um, and, and my video won't go up so you get to see Sarah, but I'm talking. <laughs> I would echo exactly what Sarah said. I also have a only child at home, so um, it's been really hard. It's also hard to accept that I'm not as cool as their peers anymore, but that's a whole other parenting uh, seminar. Um, so one thing we've done that was really interesting and fun is together we Googled um, things to do with your parents that you might actually enjoy. And in there, it came up with some really great ideas. So we just encourage parents to get really creative, let your child take the lead and let your child have a, a say in the activities you want to try out. Okay, uh, the next question is, how do parents teach subjects that they do not understand and that the teacher has not had a virtual class on the material yet? I would really encourage you to reach out to the teacher uh, for information and guidance on that. Our teachers are still available, so connect with the classroom teacher, let them know you're struggling um, on how to teach certain subject matters and see if they can direct you to some helpful websites or YouTube videos on how to uh, teach that topic. If I could jump in on that one, um, if if it could be the teacher doesn't have the internet capabilities at home or the home environment for the teacher is really difficult to run those synchronous sessions. So if that's the case, don't hesitate to also uh, engage the principal or vice principal because they have access to resources that may help that situation. I know uh, I've received a few calls like that and we've been able to find solutions. Sometime uh, it's another teacher who has better internet that is able to give a lesson on something that uh, a student hasn't been able to understand and, and that's been a successful way uh, to, to help with that situation. So don't hesitate to reach out if, if you need to. Thank you. OK, so the next one is um, I work at home full time during the pandemic. My, the other parent is an essential worker and I am struggling finding the time to help the kids with school. They are frustrated and I am frustrated with the constant interruptions. How can I find a balance so the kids are not frustrated with me not having the time sorry, not having the time that they need for me. Here's uh, what we've really emphasized is mental health first, uh, academic second right now. Um, we encourage you to give yourself a break. It is really hard to work full time and then uh, also do your child, help your child with their academics. And then you have your regular household duties on top of all that. Uh, those haven't gone away either. So we invite you to give yourself a break. Um, and make sure you take care of yourself as well. It definitely is a challenge and we don't, we're not striving for perfection here or getting everything done every single day. Um, just doing the best you can with the time you have. Um, really find other ways to connect and, and squeeze in academics. I mean, if you read with your child every night, that in itself is a great thing to do. One of the other things I saw a bit ago too, because I, um, 
I totally agree with what Sue's saying in terms of um, prioritize what you need to be prioritizing um, and do what do what makes the most sense. And the other thing that they were talking about is um, we love to think in tiers and in triangles in the bottom of um, a triangle tier of thinking about activities that you have kind of in your back pocket when you as a parent, for whatever reason, do not have the time or the energy, um, basically is what they said to be investing in activities with your child in that moment. So that could be things like you have to work right now um, and what are activities that you can give them that will keep them busy. And I thought just even prioritizing that in my head as a parent of what is this period of time that I'm engaging in and is this just sort of survival activities where we need to be busy because I need to be working um, and it's okay as a parent to be planning those activities and if that means maybe there's a little bit more screen time that afternoon or maybe there's a little bit more of a mess in the kitchen or something along those lines um, that we can maybe be okay with those types of things because we're acknowledging um, these aren't times that we planned out for and that we came up with a really great plan we're surviving in these moments um, and so coming up with activities that I know in the back pocket depending on your child's age and development um, that you can pull out when you when the time the energy the whatever um, isn't there to be devoting to different kinds of activities so there are activities kids will engage in they'll keep them safe um, and then they'll give you the time to be able to do what it is that you need to be doing. So this next question is kind of similar to the last one. So I think it's probably been answered, but if it hasn't, just let us know that you would like it to be answered more. I'll read it. Um, it says some days are hard, like really hard. Trying to be a parent, teacher, and work is a constant struggle. How can we balance all of the balls in the air and be there for our kids? So I think Sue and Sarah probably touched a little bit more on this but uh, in the last one, but if you feel like you need a little bit more from it, just um, ask the question again and we'll just get some more answers from that. One thing I will comment for sure, because this has come up a lot and I certainly feel it myself as well, um, this is really, really hard. And th there's nothing to guide us through this. I mean, we are the first um, to go, th we're not the first to go through a pandemic, but we really have nothing to lean on to help guide what we're doing as parents. Um, so we're playing a lot of catch up and recognizing that balls are going to drop and that's okay um we're going to make mistakes and uh, we just have to give ourselves a break and recognize even in the best of times there are no perfect parents out there um and the what we really can do is the best we can uh with what we have at that time Thanks, Sue. Um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions, but I will give it another minute just in case anybody else does. So one thing I'll just uh, comment on, the mental health and behavior team is here. We're an email away. If there's something you want to ask, but you weren't sure if you should ask it tonight, let us know, reach out. Uh, we're here to provide support and guidance. We're still um, taking referrals. So we're still providing virtual counseling to students. So uh, the mental health and behavior team is here. Sarah and I are an email away. Should you require anything from us? We know this is hard and we want you to know you're not alone and we are here for you. So just a comment from a parent that this was great and thank you so much. That we're so happy. Thank you for that comment. It doesn't look like we're having any other new questions, so I will leave it up to you guys to do the wrap up. The wrap up, well, I think the, um, we just really appreciate, we I can't see who attended, um, but assumingly the folks were here, so we really appreciate people taking time out of their night to come 
um because obviously people as we have gone back and forth to are extremely busy at the best of times and extremely busy right time uh, sorry extremely busy right now so taking the time to come tonight we really appreciate it we do hope um, that there was some information in it that was helpful to you uh, and as sue said if there was information that was helpful to you that you would like more of by all means please reach out to us or if there was information that maybe didn't get covered um, you weren't comfortable asking about or you hang up and you're like me and at two o'clock in the morning the question pops in your head um, please reach out at any time um, and we've got lots of folks that are here to help and I will pass it back to Sue and so it, it's me here. I'm going to jump in. We've got a few more questions that popped up. Um, so we actually have uh, two here. So first one, uh, my son only wants to play video games. I try to get him to play outside, bake, do art, etc. But he only plays video games all day. How do I encourage more activity? Yeah, that's definitely a big challenge. Um, in the best of times, but especially during a pandemic. One thing, I love the problem solving approach where you, you name the problem with your child and you have them come up with the possible solutions. And at that point, you accept any solution, whether you agree or disagree, um, list the pros and cons with each solution, um, and then have them pick the best one and let's try it. Because, you know, having limits is great and set those limits and stick to them. But when your kids have involvement in the planning and the ideas, they're more likely to uh, follow through and engage so we certainly recognize getting kids off games is really hard um, setting limits is a good thing family meetings about screen time screen time contracts um, I would encourage you to check out commonsensemedia.org it has great tips for family contracts around screen time. It also has great tips around um, healthy use. Um, so that is a great resource specifically for managing screen times for children. Okay, so the last question I see here is, do you know of any safe apps that you can recommend that children can talk with other children through or play games online together? So Ella recommends Kid Messenger. <laughs> what I really like about Kid Messenger is I screen all her messages. I can see everything she's doing on there. I know when their friends are calling, who's calling her, because it actually pops up on my phone. Um, that is a good one. Again, Common Sense Media is a great website that has a list of all the apps, um, all the online games, and I would encourage you to check that out. And it rate it has ratings from not only parents but the kids. So it talks about what age is it for, things to watch out for, is it appropriate? Um, so again, Common Sense Media is a great site to find information about uh, uh, gaming, apps, um, anything online really. Okay, that appears to be the last question. <laughs> so we'll leave that with maybe uh, Sue, if you have any last words you want to add to it, but. I don't think so. I just really appreciate everyone coming, spending time with us. I glanced outside. It's a beautiful sunny day, so we appreciate you taking the time. And again, I just want to echo that the mental health and behavior team is here. Uh, we're an email away. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions, concerns, you're looking for more information. Uh, we're here and, and you're not alone. So thanks again for joining. So I guess Sarah and I wish you all a wonderful night and um, enjoy the rest of this beautiful evening. Thank you everyone. <laughs>